Talent shortages in the US have more than tripled in the last 10 years, with 69% of employees struggling to fill positions last year. Corn Ferry estimates that by 2030, the global talent shortage could reach 85.2 million people, resulting in the loss of trillions of dollars in economic activity. The energy industry has been especially hard hit. The pandemic has redefined expectations around work and what work-life balance might look like moving forwards. Attitudes around climate change and the industry's environmental impact are shifting. Attracting the best talent remains challenging. So what does all this mean for your employees? How can you improve the employee experience in order to improve retention rates and hang on to your top talent? What are the key skills required for success in the months and years ahead? And how do we reskill in order to close the digital gap? Here to provide their thoughts, please welcome our brilliant panel. David Cushion, Head of Learning at Anglo-American. Mike Carroll, VP of Innovation for Georgia Pacific. And Brett, Brent Kinzierski, Chief Learning Officer over at Human Works. Uh, folks, many thanks for joining us. Lovely to see you all. Good to be Good here. To be here. Thanks for joining. Yeah, listen, great to have you all with us. Um, really looking forward to this conversation. We've got lots to get through. Um, so uh, we're going to dive in in just a minute. Um, I think we're still waiting for Brent to appear. Have we got Brent there? There we go. Yep. We've got yeah, Brent. Right here. Yeah, we've got me? Brent. Oh, there we go. It was, uh, yeah, I think it was um, a mic we were missing. But I think we've got all three of you now. Wonderful stuff. So listen, um, let's, uh, let's hand straight over to you, Brent. I think you're going to be leading us through this panel. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to you. Um, I'll be taking questions from the floor, folks. Uh, so if anybody has any questions for the panel as we're going along, do let us know. And uh, I will be back to facilitate that towards the end of the session. Uh, but for now, Brent, uh, David and Mike, over to you. Thank you so much for the introduction. Much appreciated. And we're very glad to be here with you all today to share about 40 minutes and then about 10 minutes of questions. We've got about um, five questions we're going to go through, about seven minutes each. And I just wanted to tell you, when I was asked to identify two people to join me in this session, I thought about scarce talent and reskilling and the whole idea and the new market of the brandable employee, the brandable person. And when you think about that, it's always about the relationship you have with somebody that you know. And your relationship's always about what do you get from that person? So what knowledge do you get? What skills do you get? How do they motivate you? Um, what networks do they tap you into? And how do they make you a better person, a stronger, a worker, a, 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 a better experience? So these are two gentlemen that I've worked with in the past that I have the utmost respect for as far as what they give back to me just by me having a relationship with them. So when we talk about my own reskilling and my own upskilling, um, these two individuals have been very helpful on my journey. So I think that's the whole um, idea behind reskilling and upskilling in this market is giving employees a great experience and connecting them where they see the value of their time, attention, and energy. So with that, I'm going to um, just give you a little bit of position about you know, we're talking here about environmental, social, and governance. And we talk about that aspect. We really want to talk about the social aspect of upskilling and reskilling and talent in today's markets. Um, so with that, I'm going to turn to David and ask him the first question. And um, just, um, you know, in his role of, of head of learning at Anglo-American, he's got a very wide view. And honestly, before that, he was head of learning itself. Um, so David, the social impacts that you see uh, through your depth and breadth of experience, what do you see driving the reskilling in today's marketplace? Yeah, thanks Brent. Um, <clears throat> I was reflecting probably on my previous experience at Shell when uh, you and I worked together for a while. Um, there was one part of that uh, scope where we were looking at training in our retail uh, sector. That's probably half a million people in, you know, 50,000 sites around the world. And we could demonstrate that by upskilling people in particularly in their sales work, that you could increase your know, volumes and premium sales. So there was very much a, what was originally a commercial value proposition as a driver for doing that. 
Um, and then we realized actually there was a huge retention aspect. So we moved from this idea of it's being important from a CVP perspective to being actually all, also important as an EVP, it was a value proposition for the individuals themselves. And then in many countries around the world, uh, there was a societal reason for doing it. So our whole focus became about uh, community upskilling in places like Malaysia, where people could get insurance uh, as a result of their retail qualification, the portable skills that they could take to others. Um, I always admired McDonald's like that, that people would say, yeah, you know, that first job equips you to take those skills portable, not just that you may stay at McDonald's, but you can take those experiences and skills elsewhere. Um, in mining and metals where we are where I'm working now is huge community responsibilities at all of our mine sites around the world. In fact, we're in many cases, we are the employer in, 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 in many of those communities. And a lot of commitments to the local communities that for every you know, job inside the mine site, we have, we're trying to create economic opportunities times five outside of the mine site, particularly in Southern Africa, um, investing in hundreds of schools in those communities becomes important for, um, for, for the work that we do there. So um, people often think there's a technological drive as to what's driving a lot of the upscaling work that we do, but more so it's a societal drive that, that, that's uh, putting us down that road. Yeah, that's a, that's a great response. And it is that societal, you know, what are we doing to enrich communities? What are we doing to um, make an impact of our footprint and where our footprint is? So to you, Mike, when we talk about the, and you obviously with Georgia Pacific, you're head of innovation and operations. Um, and we, you and I've talked a lot about your workforce um, and the needs and the conditions that are going on. So what are your views uh, as far as the social impact of the reskilling that you're seeing? I, I think as you, as you, as you look at, you have to have this understanding that that people are starting to value their contribution towards society different, and and I th I think as a company as a company or companies in industry, we we had this mentality that was a legacy mentality across all of industry that basically said employees were replaceable, and we're in the midst of this big change that says that employees need to be renewable. And if you find people that want to work for you, you better figure out how to, how to upskill and reskill. Because what's going to happen to you, if, if you have a large turn, turnover going on in your company, and you have people that on any given day, you're after having to carry extra talent, what they're actually telling you is they don't like the way you're getting things done. And, 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 and they probably don't like the, the, the way you think about their social interaction, right, with the way you go get things done. So you need to start thinking more broadly about how you bring all of that together in order to make them feel different about how they contribute to that tomorrow and, and how they get, how you get things done and help them get those things done. Yeah, that's a, that's, a, that's a good point in terms of you know their view because I'm seeing a lot of the younger generation they really care about what social impact their organization's making, what role do they play in that rather than just being cogs in a wheel, um, and also they still have those fears about their role with automation, the human machine mix. Um, so that kind of takes us into the next question of, you know, what trends do we see? I mean, we've talked a little bit about some of the trends, but, you know, one of the trends that I see is we're going into these cyber physical systems where you have operators um, that kind of went from controlling to optimizing their processes. You've got the emergence of new technologies and the relationship of these workers. Um, and if we don't start to upskill and reskill them, with the human machine mix, my point of view is that automation is going to take over much faster. And I worry that in industry, um, because of these short tenure cycles and the, the retention of employees that, you know, for the organization, it might say it's easier for us to automate something than 
to train an operator to understand big data and analytics to do better predictive maintenance or something like that. So one of the trends I'm seeing is, will organizations take up the investment to retrain and retool their workforce, or is it easier sometimes to just continue to automate? And I, I just worry about that. But David, what's your thoughts on just some of the trends that are going on? Yeah, certainly automation is, is a very big factor in our industry. Uh, heavy equipment, uh, an awful lot of automation and remote operations increasingly coming in remote operation control centers. It's a good thing in a way when you're taking people out of um, you know, dangerous environments, um, but it's also creates that challenge of the need to you know, reskill people in and have different roles um, as those changes take place. Um, but that pace of technological change is rapid, really, really rapid, and uh, it causes us you know, lots of challenges in the work we do on identifying you know, how, how that evolves in terms of people's roles. Um, but there's also then the emergence of new roles that comes with that. You've mentioned some of them, Brent. And then how can we identify those people that can transition into roles that we wouldn't have thought of years ago, and particularly in the, in the space of digitalization and data science, increasingly um, lots more opportunities there before. And you can think back to you know, PCs in the 80s, wiped out millions of typists and those types of roles, but created a whole bunch of new roles that uh, people would never have thought of and industries that emerged as a result of that. And I, you start to see some of that happening, if not directly in your own organization, the supply chains around you are also, are also changing. So increasingly, when we're thinking about employability and people's competitiveness for the future, in many cases, if it's not within our organization, it's potentially within our you know, extended supply chains and in our, in our partnerships that we have. So but we think much more broadly beyond just our employee base into the whole you know, worker ecosystem around, around our operations. Okay, good. Thanks. And to you, Mike, you know, we've talked in the past about 10 year cycles and other things that you believe impact reskilling. What would, what would be the top one or two things that you're seeing that are impacting the ability to either upskill or just entirely reskill some of your workforce areas? I, I think it's the ability to understand kind of where you need to need to fit into the future. And, and so all the inflation, inflationary pressures on, on labor are going to force you to, to more automation. And, and as you go to more automation, you're always going to have to have some degree of labor proximal to, to the equipment. And that means that as automation be, becomes more and more com complex, and, and as David said, that brings in more opportunities. And the reason it brings in more opportunities is you can't stand up silos of automation that are that are that numerous in, inside facilities and, and ar around all these operations and expect them to function independently. So now you got to orchestrate. And so you have to have a different level of competence inside the, ar and around the facility to do that, proximal to the equipment. And you always have to have that. And so... The other thing is when you think about how do you bring context to what happens, you also have to think about what does it need to be proximal and how do I use that to bring that knowledge where it needs to be when it needs to needs to be there. And so once once your asset is fixed, the three the three major cost levers we have as manufacturers, all manufacturers, is raw materials, energy, and the ops model. Right, the one thing you have in control of is the ops model, and inflationary inflationary pressure on labor are going to drive you to more automation. So your ops model is the biggest controllable you have, and how you think about control proximal to the equipment, and how you upskill and reskill in order to get what needs to be done done just in a different way, and the way you deliver knowledge. That's the biggest challenge we all have. And, 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 and as you think about it from an ES and, and G perspective, only what has to be proximal is done proximal, and the rest of the stuff is delivered through the wonderful technology platforms we have. The other thing, Grant, that's uh, regardless of um, you know, that, 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 that automation drive, it, it's very much become a focus of us immediately and needs to be for everyone. It, you're no longer just training people and 
empowering people and skilling people for performance today. You need that, you continue to have to do that, but you have to be able to build the skills and capability you need to perform today and for people to be competitive for tomorrow. And the challenge, of course, is time. People are really struggling for time. Um, and I, I, I think even through you know, lockdown periods, people were working harder and working longer. And you think, hang on, you've just given people back a, a commute time, but uh, that's not been the experience people have had. They've, they've worked extremely hard through challenging period of times. And uh, it's, it's difficult for people to have the capacity and the time to develop themselves for their future, as opposed to the, the role they're doing today. So it's incumbent on leaders, it's incumbent on organizations to recognize that people need to be given that time and that to create the adaptability for their for their future or else they'll only ever be stuck in the dead the day and that's going to run out yeah and i think it goes to that whole learning ecosystem that a company can create because you know the employee experience and we're finding out more and more of the the neuroscience and the wellness um from a humanistic perspective of, of investing in people's learning and you know they're finding that you know employee learning is another wellness characteristic of, you know, are you making them feel the self-efficacy and the self-actualization that they feel they're growing and they're just not a cog in, in the wheel? And do they have time? And, you know, it's it's interesting to me because I still think a lot of people's work week is, you know, 35 percent, you know, administrative, looking for data, problem solving. And if we can use our connected systems to alleviate that experience of, you um, what they're having to go through and make more time available so they can think and collaborate and get coached and mentored. Um, we've got to make those shifts to the appreciation of, you know, generating this knowledge from work. And I think some of these connected systems with the big data, they're going to start changing roles even faster. And they're going to start saying, well, wait a minute, we're learning from learning and we're changing roles again. So, I think there's a lot of, you know, these trends impacting this, what I call a cycle that is impacting. I'm even looking at trends today that, you know, one trend is really having an impact on another trend. <clears throat> so I think we've kind of established that there's a lot of things to consider in upskilling and reskilling. Um, so that kind of takes us to the, the next question of, uh, you know, this whole challenge is the digital transformation. You know, we got people challenges, we got process challenges. Um, I always say that, you know, technology's complex and people are complicated. So you put those two things together and that's a big mix. Um, and then, so we're doing this thing where we're trying to upskill and reskill people to, to harvest the benefit of big, you know, uh, big data analytics, all those kind of things. And we're trying to use technology to stop unsafe work, you know, using sensors and drones to get in high spaces or confined spaces um, and try to get, you know, all this data that's coming filtered and personalized to people so they can actually use the three things that I think to them, tomorrow's workers and really today's need to use is their cognitive abilities, their creative abilities and their collaborative abilities. And that's what people really want to get engaged in their work and not do so much of the, the mundane things. So David, you know, your views, I mean, I know you've been in a lot of the technology spaces with innovation automation, um, and you've seen more than probably most in terms of digital transformation challenges. Um, what's your perspective on we rise up and we increase the digital density and footprint, but at the same time, we're trying to build this human machine mix, but at the same time, we have to run operations. And you're especially, um, you know, when you operate in a lot of areas that um, are underground or don't have all the um, benefits of really being digitally fluent at that area. Probably uh, two particular challenges, friends. Uh, one I would just call adaptability. You know, have we, do we have, have people got the adaptability to be able to develop and change and acquire new skills? And do they have the motivation and back to the factor of time? Are they given the time and support by their, by their line to do so? So that's everything around adaptability. Um, 
and then it's about speed. Can you can people develop the skills faster than the pace of technology? And that's probably the biggest factor, um, because the pace of technological change is increasing, and therefore you need to have much more agile uh, learning methods. And if you go even upstream from the corporate sector in terms of education, you then it, it, I think it will start to change mindsets around um, you know, tertiary education and even uh, earlier education around the, the length of time that people go through a college degree or a university degree. Right. You're seeing probably a resurgence of a different type of apprenticing. We see that in the UK. Um, where people are choosing not to go off and take four-year degrees on a very special subject and instead take very you know, different approaches to apprenticing in uh, future skills and acquiring you know, short tenure assignments with, in, in gig work. And that, that really means they're coming into a different skill set in their early 20s. And that, that's quite a disruptive in the education sector. Um, we're starting to see us being challenged around our own talent acquisition strategies where we would historically have sourced talent in the past through those traditional types of uh, recruitment methods. We may want to be thinking differently around the type of talent we source for the future. Uh, I was speaking with an HR colleague a few months back who said, who said, could you imagine a world where you're not offering employment contracts, but you're offering development contracts? So we want you to come and work here to develop these skills and we will find the work for you but it's incumbent on you to come and develop the skills that we need. So we start talking about development contracts, not about employment contracts. And a, lot of, a lot of those things are becoming very, very live. Right. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because like we're seeing these shifts with whether it's performance management or coaching. Um, you know, I think a, a Gartner study recently said that 65% of managerial tasks are gonna go away just due to automation. So we got to look at the shifts that that means on the employee. And it's funny because we talk about, you know, companies number one priority or two is the upskilling and reskilling of the employee. Well, I think the employees are starting to say, well, to your point, that's their number one priority to stay employable, to stay competitive, to stay relevant. They've got to continually work for companies that are offering them the latest and greatest in terms of skills. And, you know, they don't want them on mundane routine fit. So interesting. Um, and Mike, so you've got a big digital roadmap at uh, Georgia Pacific. What's your thoughts around all these challenges that you're seeing, especially as, you know, your view of the innovation man at um, Georgia? I think, I think sometimes you learn it's simple. And, and, and you and I had this conversation when COVID hit, we turned off all the badges to all, all the plants and found out just who had to be there and who didn't have to be there. The interesting thing was productivity went up 20% when we decluttered everybody's lives at the, at the facilities, which meant that we had too many people trying to create value through too few, right? <laughs> and, and, and once you decluttered everybody's lives, it, ga it gave us the, the, the notion that, that uh, actually dashboards were the fastest way to yesterday. And now we have a different way of thinking about what we think the world's going to look like and, and, and the way we're building it is we actually just think really simply, what do you, what do you need to know? What do you need to know that you don't know? And that's the probability that something's going to happen because without probability, you can't prioritize. What am I in control of? And what, and what am I not in control of that can, that can affect me so that I have context for those two things in, or, in order to, to go do something about it and collaborate with another human and keep it that simple because it turned out these people are really good at running these facilities. When you keep it simple, when you don't give them a thousand other things to go do from a bunch of other people that distract them from the very thing they're there for. Right. Right. And, and so, you know, in, in, in this once upon a time effort of building all this content to skill people away from what they were originally there for. And Brent, we've had this conversation a lot. You clutter their lives. You make it overly complex. And, and I think getting back to what needs to get done, right? How, how, what do you need to know to get that done? How does that inform what support looks like? That, that's as hard as it gets. 
And just Mike, we've had this. What, what I've seen from uh, what Mike was saying, um, we're also seeing in the past, you wanted people to have a breadth of skills and just you know, uh, resonating what Mike was saying around the focus that people have when you take away some of the distractions. We're also seeing that in the future, you need much more depth in a lot of specialist skills as opposed to breadth across the board. So uh, it's changing that T model breadth and depth. It's much more depth in a lot more specialist areas. So instead of having broad roles, you're probably having more roles that are much more specialized and, and new roles that you haven't thought of before. So we talk about this whole change transformation and complexity, you know, um, and we talk about change. We say, well, there's four things. There's, do you have a case for change? Can you make a business case? And then can you create a shared vision from that? And then do you actually have the capacity, meaning, you know, the people, the resources, the money, but most important in capacity is the intellectual capacity. I've talked to so many people that want to change, but they just don't have the tenacity to change. And that's probably the biggest thing that I see as a drawback. And then you get these actionable first steps. But, and we've seen this clutter, and Mike, you have talked about it, so many systems. And when digital came about, you know, is the hype cycle and everybody was doing everything digital. So your company would have 60 different digital platforms and tools that couldn't connect, couldn't talk to each other. And you just created a bunch of micro silos that you don't have any red thread. So when you champion change, what's, what's the advice? Keep it simple. And, and the reason you need to keep it simple is because the technology costs one tenth of what the change costs. And typically the change costs so much because you make it so difficult. David, what's your view on this whole micro and mega aspects of change? I'd agree with Mike, keep it simple. I think the other thing you recognize is a third of the people will typically make it uh, because of their own tenacity to use your word, Brent. A third will make it, but they need support. And a third, I think you probably just have to acknowledge will not make it. And therefore you need to think differently around how you redeploy them. Um, and that's, that's, that's the hardest piece. People are renewable. Yeah. All right. So we're getting close to the, the end. And, you know, Mike, again, lots of experience from you. You've seen, you've seen obviously a lot and, and have done a lot. What's those three things? I mean, you know, people are on this call where our theme is, you know, scarce talent, resourcing. You know, what's the advice? What's the, what's the philosophy of this from you? I say, you know, I think I would, I would start with show me your friends and I'll show you your future, mm -hmm. right? Your peer group says everything about you. And so if, if you don't like your results, change out, change who you're hanging out with, right? This panel's a part of it, right? It, it affects how you think. Transparency drives behavior, right? You can't keep things in the shadows and expect any, anything to change. And, and, it, and the other thing is if you have lots of turnover, your employees are telling you something. You need, to, you need to listen. What they're really telling you is they don't like the way you're getting things done. And you need to change. Listen. David, what's your three things, as you would say? And I put yeah, that I always, question in there for you. I always like three things, as they say in Dublin. Um, but I'll go with two, Brent, if you don't mind. I would, uh, as I have done here over the last 18 months, two years, we've really made skills the heart of our development strategy. Everything around how we, how we equip people for today and how we prepare people to be competitive for tomorrow. So make skills the center of your development strategy and think about performance today, as well as competitiveness for tomorrow. That's both for individuals, but also for organizations. Get people fit for their future. That's good. And for me, I'll just give three quick ones. You know, I do so much of this research on the workforce, and it's giving the workforce clear purpose, giving them relatedness, that they understand why they're employed and why the company wants them employed, and giving them an experience that keeps them wanting to come back. So I'll turn it over to you, sir, with that. 
Yeah, great stuff. Thanks, Brent. Thanks, Mike. Thanks, David. Some fascinating conversation there. Um, so much there that I could dig into, um, but actually we've got a couple of questions from our audience, so I'm going to prioritise those and get those up here. And our first audience question today comes from Jeff over at McDermott. Hi there, Jeff. Good to see you. <coughs> Thanks for joining us. Jeff, I can see you. I can't hear you at the moment. May still be on mute. The curse of the, uh, the last couple of years. There we go. Should be got clear you. now. Yeah, we got you yeah. now. Yeah, I mean, my question was around whether you're seeing a desire for people to self-taught teach themselves, or and have you seen any success from digital learning programs to basically give them the tools to uh, learn on their own? Yeah, I, I, can you hear me okay, Jeff? Yeah. I see a mix of both, but we've got a lot of external partners we work with, you know, LinkedIn Learning, Coursera, Udemy, Udacity, so a lot of external learning libraries, um, some of which we use and we make available to our, to our teams and our colleagues um, uh, through enterprise licenses, so quite good uptake on that. But we're also seeing um, that some of these organizations organization will come to us and says, are you aware that 10,000 Anglo employees have logged into one of these channel partners on their own accounts. Yeah, So we are seeing people also go outside and, and, and look for learning and development resources, um, which is helping inform our, 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 um, our curation strategy that says, if people are looking outside, they're clearly not getting enough inside that is for the, about them as an individual. So we start to think about some development in three ways. The heart of your development being your professional development, whatever your particular you know, professional uh, trade is, whether that be a geologist or a marketeer. So your professional development and the company will help you be the best you can be. The second is your personal development, and then you need to take control of that. And the third is your leadership development. And leadership, including if you're an individual contributor, you're a leader of a team, if you're a leader of managers, or if you're a leader of an organization. Even at the your embryonic levels of leadership, you also have to think about managing self as well as managing others. So that's how we've woven our, our thinking around how we develop people to be the best they can be um, and listen to the fact that if they are going externally, then we're, we're clearly not meeting their needs. So can we bring some of that outside in as well? Thanks, David. Great, Mike, thank you. Yeah, Mike, any thoughts from yeah, you on that? I do. So, the, so the, an, the answer is yes, and you basically got one shot at this. So it has to be lower impedance than what, what it is in their personal lives. And they have to be able to easily find what they're looking for because they're used to YouTube and Google and anything else. And if, and if you can't meet that or exceed that, you're out. Yeah. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. Um, Brent, we'll give some, uh, give some thoughts, uh, get some thoughts from you. I think it's all about, you know, content shock today. There's so much that people have access to and they need to filter. They need to get it personalized and filtered. I always hear the study that what was put on YouTube yesterday, if a baby was born yesterday, it would take that baby 90 years to just watch what was created yesterday. So you got to think about selective uh, attention. Great question. Yeah, great. Thanks, Jeff. Yeah, yes. Cutting through the noise, is that going to be absolutely critical? Thanks for the question, Jeff. Much appreciated. Um, our next question comes from Henri over at Total. Hi there, Henri. <coughs> great to see you, Henri. Again, I can't hear you just yet. You may still be on mute there. Yeah, do you hear me now? Yeah, we got you now, loud and clear. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you for the discussion and the thoughts. Uh, you know, I'm not, uh, I've, I was not born yesterday, so I've been working quite a long time and I basically at today at my career, I feel that uh, we start to be overwhelmed by micromanagement compared to what was the freedom and the independence and the initiative that I was able to, to have in my uh, early, early career. And I think that maybe, uh, I, I mean, I like to blame, to blame IT as everybody, and also, but I think all the new IT tools or the new digital tools are, which are offering, which allows uh, 
to uh, be your management be much more aware on the real time and also uh, to be more to do I mean to have this increasing speed of reporting every day every time things like that and all these new digital applications also uh, are probably uh, uh, driving uh, intermediate management to do more much more micromanagement than in the past and then that it may uh, start to create uh, like a, a bad feeling within the young people employees by, by uh, saying that okay I'm, I am watched all the time uh, I what what about my initiative what about my creativity do I have time to think and to propose something so uh, the, I just wonder whether this new digital world is also giving bad direction in this uh, in this direction because I think micromanagement when it is badly done is the worst of everything and it's very good to really uh, 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 make uh, employees uh, very bad and uh, not happy to work in an organization great question Henri. yes yeah, so how do we avoid stifling initiative innovation in this new world of work um, Mike maybe I can come to you first with that one yeah, I think, it, I think it depends on the company. Um, right now, within the next, let's say, half decade to a little longer than that, you're going to see a massive change in the way companies think about themselves. And, and so right now, companies try and prioritize things into a realm where their data is growing exponentially, right? And so the way their institutions are built, they prioritize and then data grows exponential and they're always sub-optimized, right? And, and so that leaves this, this opportunity gap. So what you're gonna see is companies start to reorganize themselves around the ability to capture value at the rate that data grows. And, and the net result of that is that the, is the enterprise will become largely built around digital and the automation around digital in the same way that you would see that somebody like Amazon or Facebook's functions, right? And, and so that the humans will be built around collaboration on the human part of the enterprise, which now means there will be less micromanagement around, around the, what the digital is good at and, and more, more focus on how do we collaborate to make the digital more successful. And so the companies that are really successful in the future will be the ones that create value at the rate that their data grows. Great stuff. Thanks, Mike. Um, uh, David, I'll get some quick thoughts from you. We're, we're almost to time here, but I'll get some thoughts from you and Brent before we wrap up. Yeah, I recognise the points uh, you're making, and I think we all experienced that, particularly through lockdown. We heard people say, you know, I'm not working from home, I'm living at work. Um, but it requires individuals to kind of create their own boundaries um, in a way that they didn't have to in the future. Um, a lot of people like commuting. It's when they could read a book or when they could, you know, listen to music or process their thoughts before their first meeting or reflect on the day's work. Um, and a lot of that went away. So um, an, an aspect of that is, you know, creating, creating our own boundaries. I, I like what my own boss has done um, uh, in that he created water cooler moments uh, on a Friday afternoon digitally. We would just come and get together with a coffee or whatever we were doing. Not because he was organizing a meeting, because he just wanted to check in on everyone, how they were, you know, we just talked about whatever we talked about. So creating those moments that matter in a, in a week that is not about micromanaging or not about using technology to, to drive the work, but actually for connecting people. If I think of my own children and the multiple channels they use on their multiple devices to connect in their various social circles, um, it can be a great thing. But likewise, with children on devices, it can be a destructive thing. So it's, it's, as Mike said, it's about getting that balance right. On the product we're using today, I had never heard of Zoom uh, in December 2019. I'd never heard of it. By Easter 2020, I was running gym circuit sessions for a sports team I coached through Zoom. So that, that changed rapidly and where I would love going down to the gym with the kids I coach, we just adapted to, to being able to do it in a, in a digital way. So. Yeah, great stuff. Um, Brent, I'll just give some final thoughts to you here. Yeah. So if you look at work and you work at the composition of work, I mean, think about how much time do you spend a day thinking, just thinking. How much time do you spend today actually collaborating with people to innovate, to be very, you know, creative? 
we don't think that's a good thing today. If we see somebody thinking, we think, well, they're not working, or we think somebody's talking and collaborating, they're really not working. We've got to change this mindset to what work looked like in the 1950s, because we've carried that along with us. It's sitting in a cubicle, and if you know, COVID proved that you don't have to be micromanaged to produce outputs. And we need to get people to work in, in cycles of flow. So my best days of the week, I work Saturday and Sunday because I don't get bothered and I can get my flow together. And that's when I work. And I might not work Wednesday or Thursday. So we got to create moments of flow. We got to appreciate that the kinds of work and what we want to pay humans for, those three C's, is changing. I don't want them to pay to be wrote. I don't want them to pay to memorize things or do small scale repetitive things. I want them to be connecting, creating, thinking. Yeah, I love this idea of having to rethink the whole way we approach uh, the humans within the enterprise. Um, Henri, many thanks for the question. Uh, it's a great question. Uh, and panel, thank you so Good. much for providing your thoughts. Thanks, Brett, for leading us through it. Great to chat to you all. You take care.